Hello there, just before we get into today's video, why not check out a new channel from me called War of Graphics? Want to know all the details about some of history's most famous battles and wars? Come join me on War of Graphics. From Sherman's March to the Sea to Operation Barbarossa, if it's got people fighting each other, we'll cover it. There is a link below. I hope to see you over there. And now, today's video. The last battle of the Vietnam War occurred in mid-May of 1975, just two weeks after the fall, or liberation, depending on which side you were on, of Saigon. These days, however, the incident has largely been forgotten, perhaps because it didn't actually take place in Vietnam, nor did American Marines square off against NVA or Viet Cong forces, but rather against belligerents from a neighboring country who'd been at odds with Vietnam for millennia. Though nobody's sure who said it first or when, an ancient proverb states that the enemy of my enemy is my friend. If the aforementioned adage was a universal truth, an enemy of the new Socialist Republic of Vietnam should have been a friend of the United States. But in this instance, that was not the case. During the incident, nearly 50 American servicemen were wounded, nearly 40 were killed in action, and three more were captured, beaten to death, and buried in shallow graves. Sadly, had the United States recognized this country's claim to a 12-mile territorial buffer around its coastline, the whole affair may have been avoided altogether. And now, the Maraguez Incident. Nearly four decades before the Khmer Rouge gained control of Cambodia, French colonial administrators concocted the Brevi Lines, a register which islands in the Gulf of Thailand belonged to Cambodia and which belonged to Vietnam. Both countries had little choice but to accept their colonial master's arbitrary ruling, but with much of Southeast Asia in chaos in the spring of 1975, the Khmer Rouge demanded that all Vietnamese forces leave its territory immediately. This went for the historically disputed lands between the two countries' borders, along which the Ho Chi Minh Trail ran and, in particular, the islands of Phu Quoc and Ko Tang in the south. But at the same time as it was being ordered out, Vietnam was conspiring to take additional territory and islands from the smaller and less powerful neighbor. As a result, during the summer, fall, and winter of 1975, various disputed coastal islands changed hands numerous times, often after brutal engagements that ended in unspeakable atrocities. In one instance, on the 10th of May, Khmer Rouge forces captured the Tho Chu Islands, after which they executed the nearly 500 Vietnamese civilians who resided there. Not surprisingly, the Vietnamese responded with brutal reprisals. Though small and ill-equipped, the Khmer Navy actively patrolled its coastal waters to deter further incursions and to ensure that merchant ships didn't supply its internal and external adversaries with arms. In addition, the Navy regularly boarded and inspected Thai fishing boats and had run-ins with ships from Korea, Sweden, and Panama, to name a few. But though the Khmer Rouge was especially suspicious of all outsiders, they were particularly wary of the Americans, specifically the CIA, which had installed bankrolled and manipulated the hopelessly corrupt Lon Nol regime that had ruled the country before the Civil War. On May the 12th, the US container ship SS Marguez was passing the coastline between Vietnam and Cambodia en route to Thailand. On board were nearly 300 containers, more than 70 of which contained undisclosed freight that had been picked up from the embassy in Saigon before the evacuation. At just after 2 p.m., a Khmer Navy patrol boat was spotted approaching the Marguez at a high rate of speed, and when it was within a few hundred yards, the heavy machine gun on its bow erupted, spewing a hail of lead across the path of the larger ship. Initially, Captain Charles Miller ordered the engine room to reduce speed, but when the assailants produced and fired an RPG at the waterline dangerously close to the hull, he brought the ship to a full stop. Certain that the situation was about to go from bad to worse, the radio operator quickly broadcast a mayday that was picked up by an Australian vessel nearby. A moment later, more than a dozen armed Khmer Rouge soldiers were in the pilot's house. Since the Cambodians didn't speak English and the Americans didn't speak Khmer, communication was nearly impossible, and the atmosphere became incredibly tense. Ultimately, Commander Sar Main pointed at the ship's map, indicating that he wanted the captain to take Maraguez to a point farther east of the island. At gunpoint, Captain Miller and the 38 crewmen did as they'd been ordered, and by 4 p.m., the ship was anchored and another 20 Khmer Rouge soldiers were on board. Then, a few hours later, after multiple communications with his superiors, Sar Main once again pointed to the map, this time making it clear that he wanted the ship taken to the naval base at Reem. 
Tapping on the radar screen and shaking his head from side to side, Captain Miller convinced him that the vital navigation tool wasn't working, and that if they proceeded, the ship might strike submerged rocks and sink. Considering the situation, Sarmeen again radioed his superiors, and he was instructed to sit tight until they decided what to do. Myers's distress call was forwarded from the Australian vessel to the U.S. Embassy in Jakarta, and from there to President Gerald Ford, who hastily convened a meeting of the National Security Council. Keen to avoid another situation like the one involving the USS Pueblo in 1968, the President and his advisors made wrapping up the affair quickly and quietly a priority. Considering the rumors of atrocities leaking out of Cambodia, and because the U.S. government didn't have any official diplomatic relations with the Khmer Rouge, keeping the crew away from the mainland was of utmost importance. After the meeting in Washington, U.S. reconnaissance P-3 Orions, based in Thailand, were dispatched to locate the ship, while President Ford instructed Secretary of State Henry Kissinger to reach out to his contacts in China to see if they could convince the Khmer Rouge to release the ship and its crew. But though the P-3s located the ship quickly, they were fired upon by anti-aircraft gun and had to abort their mission. With the situation deteriorating, Marines in Japan and the Philippines were put on alert, and the aircraft carrier USS Coral Sea, two destroyers, and various support ships were ordered to the area. Now convinced that firing on the P-3s would lead to heavy retaliatory strikes, Sarmeen ordered Captain Miller to reposition the ship once again. However, it didn't take long for the Americans to find it, and just a few hours after dropping anchor, the sky over the Gulf of Thailand was swarming with F-111s and F-4 Phantoms. Using their 20mm rotary cannons, the Phantoms strafed the water immediately ahead of the ship's bow, indicating that further movement would be met with lethal force. The American planes departed as the sun set, and intent on making the most of their reprieve, Sarmeen ordered his men to load the Merchant Mariners into fishing boats and take them to the island of Koh Tang, about 30 miles off the coast. The following day, Marines began arriving at U Tapao Airport near Pattaya, Thailand, in preparation for a hastily planned multi-pronged assault that would commence the following morning. If all went according to plan, dozens of Marines would rappel from CH-53 helicopters onto the top of the shipping containers stacked on the deck of the Marguez. While en route, however, one of the CH-53s crashed, killing the five-man crew and 18 Marines on board, and as a result, the entire mission was cancelled. Again, the Americans were loaded into small boats destined for the port at Kampong Som to the east when F-111s, F-4s, and A-7s appeared and began firing on them. None of the boats were hit, and when at least one pilot visually confirmed that there were Caucasians on board, the attacks were immediately called off. But though a friendly fire incident had been averted, the aircraft lost track of the boats in the port of Kampong Song. Fearing that holding the Americans prisoners there would provoke a far worse air attack that could potentially decimate Cambodia's already weak navy, the Khmer Rouge commander ordered that the crewmen be taken to Koh Rong Samalem, about 20 miles to the north. However, since this was done at night, it was unknown to the Americans. As far as they knew, some of the crew were still on Koh Tang, some were in Kampong Song, and yet others may still have been on board the Marguez. Just two days after Marguez was taken, Marine units were ordered to assault Koh Tang from two sides. What they didn't know, however, was that there weren't any American merchantmen there, and that was the least of their problems. Initial intelligence had determined that the island was occupied by 200 Khmer Rouge soldiers who were dug in and equipped with heavy machine guns, RPGs, large caliber recallless rifles, and mortars. But sadly, this information was never relayed to the mission planners, who were led to believe that the force guarding the island was one tenth of its actual size. Pre mission reconnaissance flights revealed the of Koh Tang was covered in thick jungle, and that there were only two suitable landing zones on beaches on the island's east and west sides. All told, hundreds of marines would be dropped onto the two beaches, after which, if all went according to plan, they'd storm toward the center of the island to rescue the American crew, as in the crew that wasn't actually there. The Navy and Marines briefly considered airstrikes to soften up the island's defenders, but instead, aircraft would attack multiple targets on the mainland as diversions and to prevent reinforcements from making their way to Koh Tang. Now, thanks to inaccurate intelligence, poor communication, and inadequate planning, the stage was set for the needless invasion of a strategically useless island that would ultimately result in an epic military debacle. Upon arriving at Koh Rong Samalam, Captain Miller was interrogated and asked if he could call off the airstrikes using the ship's radio. Miller explained that he could, but that he'd have to contact the company's office in Bangkok first and ask them to relay the message to the U.S. Embassy. The following day, Captain Miller and the crew were then taken back to the Marguez, after which the Khmer Rouge used the ship's radio to broadcast a message announcing that the sailors and vessel would be released. The message also stated that the Khmer Rouge had no intention of escalating hostilities with the United States, but politely asked that the latter stop conducting 
espionage activities in Cambodia's territorial waters. The transmission was picked up by the CIA station in Bangkok, translated and delivered to the White House, but nobody was sure if the message was authentic, and the decision was made to proceed with military operations until Marguez and her crew were officially back in American hands. True to the word, the Khmer Rouge delivered the crew to the destroyer USS Wilson immediately after the broadcast. Then American Marines retook the abandoned ship, and the White House was informed that the incident had been resolved. Just a few hours later, President Ford appeared on television to pass the good news on to the American public, though he conveniently omitted the part about the Khmer Rouge releasing the ship and crew voluntarily. Despite this positive turn of events, however, at Henry Kissinger's urging, President Ford refused to call off the airstrikes against mainland targets, at least until the Marines tasked with assaulting Ko Tang were off the island and out of harm's way. Now the assault on Koh Tang was even more unnecessary, but the wheels had already been put into motion. Taking increasingly heavy fire, by the time the first wave of more than 125 Marines set their boots on the island, eight of nine helicopters involved in the mission had already been shot down or severely damaged. Ultimately, approximately 230 American soldiers would be delivered to Koh Tang from ships offshore, but now, with the Margaret situation largely resolved, they were ordered to immediately cease all offensive actions and prepare to evacuate. But by then, more than two dozen men had been killed or wounded in the the Khmer Rouge defenders had no way of knowing that the assault had been called off. In the following hours, more than 100 Marines were airlifted out, but many more were still on the island, and with so few helicopters and a one-plus-hour round trip between the islands and U.S. Navy ships offshore, getting them evacuated was going to take a long time. By 2 p.m. that afternoon, Marines and the Khmer Rouge soldiers were still engaged in multiple firefights. But though the majority of the Cambodian forces had retreated to the center of the island, where they formed a tight perimeter around a sizable ammo dump, other smaller but well-armed units continued to harass the Americans who were isolated in open areas at the east and west beaches. The Marines were supported by F-4s, A-7s, and AC-130 gunships, but as the sun set, their ability to deliver fire accurately diminished. In the melee, helicopter pilots hovered their craft over both LZs, but in the turbulence, the loading process was painfully slow and the massive aircraft were easy targets. The first helicopter on site took multiple hits, but managed to get 20 Marines back to Coral Sea, and within the next few hours, another 95 men were edited out. But as the night wore on, the remaining Marines were dangerously close to being overrun, and the evacuation became exponentially more dangerous and nearly ground to a halt. Ultimately, just 32 Marines were left to defend themselves against the approaching Khmer Rouge soldiers. Most were eventually evacuated, but in the chaos, it was unclear if anyone had been left behind. Then, once everyone had regrouped back on the Navy ship, commanders discovered that three men who'd last been seen alive, Joseph Hargrove, Gary Hall, and Danny Marshall, were still unaccounted for. Then, radio operators picked up a muffled transmission in English, during which a man asked when he and his two companions could expect the next evacuation helicopter. Unsure if this was a ploy by the Khmer Rouge to draw more Americans into an ambush, the operator asked for and received an authentication code confirming that the caller was who he claimed to be. But oddly, the exhausted Marine was informed that at the moment the LZ was too hot and that he and his cohort should swim out to sea where they'd be rescued. After he informed the men on the ship that only two of the three Marines could swim, the radio fell silent. Meanwhile, planners considered a number of options to get them off, one of which was using a 14-man SEAL team to extract them under the cover of darkness. The second option was by far the least risky, and the following morning, USS Wilson cruised back and forth between the West and East beaches, broadcasting messages in both English and Khmer, informing the defenders that they had no hostile intent and only wished to evacuate the Marines, both dead and alive. Dozens of crewmen on deck scanned the beaches and the tree lines, but there was no response nor any sign of any American or Khmer Rouge soldiers. With no indication that the three Marines were still alive, Wilson departed that afternoon. During a search of West Beach on the morning of May the 16th, one of Emson's men was shot by a concealed Marine. The Khmer Rouge soldiers encircled his position, and after a short exchange of fire, captured Joseph Hargrove, who had a badly wounded leg. When the soldier who had been shot on the beach died, Emson ordered that Hargrove be executed, and the following morning, the two remaining survivors were taken into captivity. Shackled and stripped of their underwear, the last two Marines were taken to a pagoda near Kampong Som, where they were interrogated for approximately a week. Then orders came directly from Phnom Penh, possibly from Pol Pot himself, and each American was beaten to death with a tube from a B-40 rocket launcher. Hall's body was buried in a shallow grave adjacent to a remote beach, while Marshall was dumped in a nearby cove. <coughs> In mid-1976, Hargrove, Marshall, and Hall were declared missing in action, and later all received Purple Hearts. 
from the Marine Corps. Between 1991 and 1999, US and Cambodian investigators conducted seven cooperative investigations, the last of which uncovered bone fragments near where the men's bodies had been disposed of, though DNA tests couldn't conclusively prove if they were from the Americans. Nearly a decade later, the Department of Defense POWMIA Accounting Agency announced that Hall's ID card and flag jacket had been recovered as well. Officially, the United States estimated that between the assault on Koh Tang and attacks on the mainland, between 10 and 25 Khmer Rouge soldiers have been killed as a result of the incident. U.S. aircraft also destroyed a large portion of Cambodia's Navy and Air Force, significantly weakening both leading up to the impending war with Vietnam. In 1977, the Khmer Rouge began viciously attacking Vietnamese border provinces. Thousands of civilians on both sides were killed, ultimately prompting Vietnam to invade Cambodia in December of 1978. With Vietnam's help, the Khmer Rouge were ultimately defeated, and the last Vietnamese troops wouldn't return home until 1989. For the Khmer Rouge leadership, the Maagez incident reinforced their beliefs that the U.S. imperialists were determined to undermine their revolution at any cost. The United States has always claimed that the Maagez seizure was illegal, and that it took place more than six miles off the coast. But afterward, the crew presented evidence purportedly showing that the ship had been just two miles off the coast. In addition, Maagez wasn't flying a flag, leading some to speculate that the whole incident had been a deliberate provocation, but if that's the case, what America hoped to achieve is anybody's guess. Now, the last 41 names etched into the Vietnam Veterans Memorial Wall in Washington are those of the airmen and Marines killed during the assault and evacuation of Koh Tang. Of those, more than half were killed in the helicopter crash in Thailand in the first mission that was ultimately cancelled. So I won't ask whether you enjoyed today's video, but if you'd like more Vietnam War content, we've done one about five weapons from the Vietnam War, which I'm linking to on the screen now. Check it out. And thank you for watching.